Okay, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, this is, uh, we're running behind time, so this is going to be a quite short presentation, uh, short session, sorry. Uh, you already know our, our panelists here. Uh, perhaps Marcel didn't introduce himself when he was a moderator. Marcel works at the 3GI in, uh, uh, in landscapes, actually. Uh, then we have uh, Mark from the World Bank and Agus from Landscape Indonesia. Uh, can we please put the presentation? Now, what we want to discuss in this session are two topics. Is what are opportunities under the Green Climate Fund and its approach to mobilizing private sector? And the second item that we want to discuss is identifying concrete actions governments could take to attract private sector investments. So concerning the first point, what I'm gonna give is an overview of some ideas that we are discussing at GCF. And I'm gonna ask the panelists to react on those ideas and ask you as well. In this case, the question goes to you. You can tell us also when, when it's your turn of the Q&A, what you think, how can GCF mobilize private sector? Then we'll have another presentation from Marcel that will look into the second theme, which is identifying concrete actions governments could take in a private sector. Okay, this is only three slides. As you all know, and you've been discussing during these days, when we look at the forest and land use sector and we talk about Red Plus, we are actually looking at the landscape as a whole. Red Plus appeared as a, an opportunity to increase the value of a standing forest, but forests by themselves will not be, uh, will, they will not be able to protect themselves, uh, so they need additional support. Can we please click again? More, more? More. So, oh, previous, previous. So overall, what we need to look is not only at the forest, but also what happens outside the forest. And this is what has been discussed in the morning, how we engage with the private sector into deforestation-free commodities, but at the same time, how can we provide incentives for keeping the forest? And we, when we talk about incentives, we are looking, in this particular case, at the value of, or the, of the service of the, of the forest by keeping the carbon stored or by um, absorbing the carbon from the atmosphere. Next one, please. So here we see two opportunities, or we try to aggregate this in two opportunities for private sector. So we, you already know how Red Plus work, right? So there is an incentive that is gonna be provided in order to keep forests, and it's gonna be monetized in the tons of carbon that the forest, the forest will absorb or, or, or maintain. In the early years of Red Plus, we know that this was happening at the project level. Now, what we're discussing under the GCF and in compliance with the negotiations under the Convention of UNCCC is how these actions can be scaled up to the national or subnational levels. So we're not talking about red plus projects as we knew them in the past. We're talking about the countries taking actions to transform the economies and reduce deforestation as a whole. Now, what we see in the current red plus atmosphere is, is a lack of uh, demand for for absorbing those uh, emission reductions or for paying for those results that will generate incentives to protect the forest. In the GCF, we have recently approved a pilot program to pay for results. It's a $500 million pilot program that would pay $5 per ton of results that have been achieved at the national or subnational level. But there is a, a gap. How, how do we finance those results? And this is where we see the, the involvement of private sector. How can we, by giving this potential payments for results, can we attract private sector? We are all also uh, conscious that GCF will not be able to pay for all the results that will be achieved. And we are looking at how the developments are going on on, on this uh, area. There are discussions with the aviation industry that whether they could be paying or offsetting their emissions uh, from, from eventually from forests. There are discussions under the implementation of Paris Agreement on Article 6, that in, if in the future there will be a, a market-based approach for paying for the results. But at the moment, we don't have them. At the moment, we have some initiatives like the FCPF Carbon Fund, the uh, Norway Bilateral Agreements, we have the GCF as well. But we can use them as a starting point to attract investments in the phase two of Red Plus, the investment that will generate results, and give a, concrete, uh, a potential put option for a private investor, okay? So this is one opportunity. So what we need to think in this session is how we can leverage this private finance if we provide that incentive of 
paying in the future for those results, would the private sector be interested to invest in Red Plus or not? And what instruments can be used for that engagement? The second slide, please. And this is the last slide. We see the, the next one, the next one. The, what, as we were saying before, there are many companies that have committed to deforestation-free supply chains. And here we can see the correlation between deforestation and commitments by commodities. You see that in cattle, there are a few commodities, so, sorry, few companies that have committed to deforestation-free, but the large amount of, of emissions. Uh, in palm oil, it's more or less half-half, and so on. So here is another, another opportunity for the GCF. GCF engaging with these companies and looking at what actually they need. So the question to the panelists again, how do we do that? How can we take these companies, these commitments, and what can the GCF provide? GCF is a financial instrument that is very flexible. We have, we provide grants, loans, equities, guarantee, that, and we are in a position to take the risk that other uh, institutions may not take. So, question to our panelists is, previous slides, how do we engage private sector here in these uh, phases of Red Plus if we offer a potential put option or pay for the results? and how we engage with the private companies in the second opportunity. So let's start with uh, Marcel, please. Yeah, it's work. So thank you very much, Juan. Uh, yeah, regarding your question, I, actually my presentation gives a few answers, I think, but I think uh, just on the first one, on how to actually mobilize funding uh, and, and projects for Red Plus, uh, how to get that done. I think one of the things that we're looking at is not just a, a lack of, uh, of demand for products, but there's a lack of feasible projects on the ground. And I think one of the th key things GCF can do is to help with the design of projects that incorporate the elements of innovative governance that is needed for landscape-wide projects and innovative finance that helps to blend the different financial interests in that landscape. So, and that requires quite a bit of expertise and, and uh, innovation. We're dealing with very new commodities, often, uh, uh, when we talk, for instance, about peatland restoration, we can't deal with normal commodities, but we have to look at what can grow actually in rewetted peatlands. So there's a lot of research needs for this. And uh, that incubation of projects, I think, is an extremely important phase where GCF could play a key role. Uh, on supporting, supporting supply chain commitments, I think uh, there have been some excellent ideas uh, 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 already presented here uh, before, the SCCM, uh, I think uh, GCF can just uh, help to de-risk that instrument by providing some, uh, some uh, capital, both in terms of loans and grant funding uh, for such an important mechanism. Uh, Mark? It's, uh, yeah, you've gone r right to the heart of um, the tricky piece. Uh, you know, I think there's so there's a number of different pieces to, to the puzzle, right? I mean, you've got this lack of sort of bankable projects, if you like. Um, and you then have the challenge of what is actually the revenue stream from forest conservation, if you're looking at it purely from that angle. Um, and then you have sort of the public sector piece of it, which is in and around governance. And within that governance, is then how do you create the infrastructure to be able to either verify your deforestation free and or whether you are really meeting environmental and social uh, safeguards. And um, going back to your slide, Juan, about you know, the three stages of Red Plus, I mean, I, I see that GCF um, can be really important in all three of them. Um, the, I think the issue is for GCF is, is to be clear in what are the business models that you're interested in investing in and sending that uh, signal to the market. Um, otherwise, I think the, the challenge is that you're going to get 
all sorts of different proposals that look like all sorts of different things and you'll spend an enormous amount of time trying to sort through them to find out the ones that given the structure, given the board, um, you know, given a whole bunch of dynamics which fit around the COP and the GCF, you won't be able to do that business. Um, and so getting out early with clear business models around those three buckets, uh, I think is gonna make it um, much more efficient for the GCF, but it's also gonna line up and help incentivize and design a pipeline um, that makes sense. The other thing I think that would do is, I mean, just thinking about the business model between you know, the World Bank and the GCF is, is in around that leveraging and so, you know, when we think of um, the private sector, we then think about the bank group. If we've got a clearer indication of, of what those structures look like, then, uh, you know, Michael can already be proactively going out there and looking for those partnerships and bringing those, those deals uh, to the table. And the last thing I think is uh, it would be, uh, I mean, you, you're kind of doing it here, but I think there's that sort of, I wouldn't call it a consultation process because it's never ending, but you know, that market sounding of really what do these types of structures look like and then being able to go back to your board and really having a frank conversation about can we do this or can't we do this? Uh, you know, there was discussion there about uh, the IFC uh, forest bond. I mean, that's a very particular structure that, that unlocked a, a whole bunch of things immediately um, and, and, and was a great product that works in one particular context. And I think you'd want to have clarity on whether, whether and how public funds like GCF could flow and or engage with those types of structures. Um, because you know, these instruments are set up to do specific things and we, we just get into trouble when we try and force them to do, to do other things. Uh, but certainly getting behind, if you're looking for where, where's the biggest leverage point at the moment in, in this particular area, it has to be around all these commitments on supply chains and how are we addressing the delta, which is basically the difference in the cost between deforestation-free commodity versus deforestation full commodity. And there's a delta there, and at the moment, uh, consumers aren't paying that delta. There's a global public good that relates to what that difference in the price actually is. And you know, the, the question on the table is, okay, how are we, how are we splitting up that extra cost and how are we going to deal with it? Or are we going to legislate and make markets only sell deforestation free, in which case you know, the consumer will pay? But that's a legislative move that, that needs to occur. Anyway. Thank you so much. Hi, please. Thank you. Um, uh, great presentation, by the way, Juan. Um, I like the faces, one, two, three. And also um, um, that you sh uh, uh, show both, um, you know, red in terms of protection, but also uh, in terms of um, how it relates to commodities. What I think would be good is to, uh, to see a roadmap through the basis, you know, uh, uh, when at one point, uh, at what point in time you move from phase one to phase two, and from phase two to phase three. Um, and also that there are actually um, uh, uh, ways to move in between phases through securitization, for example, you know, you can just jump all the way to phase three and then uh, let the uh, financial institutions to securitize it all the way to phase two and phase one. And even pre-phase one, like what uh, uh, Marcel suggested, you know, uh, there are not enough numbers of, uh, of bankable projects and what we need to do is basically to incubate. Uh, uh, pre-investable projects. Uh, how are we going to get funding from uh, from from uh, uh, for 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 uh, incubating such uh, such ideas, such pre-investable projects? And um, there, I've, I'm, I'm I'm thinking about two possible sources. One is uh, uh, through um, your kind of funds, you know, public funds or probably philanthropies. Uh, another way is basically by securitizing, you know, all the way from phase th three or even from phase two, um, so that uh, investors are already going into uh, incubation before they see projects having been uh, prepared and investable. 
and uh, move to, uh, to, 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 to the next level. Of course, then you have to have a, you know, uh, certain deals with, with, with project owners or project developers, but that is possible. So uh, a good roadmap, I think, with those kinds of uh, uh, twists and turns would be uh, 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 quite uh, interesting to see. Risk allocation and risk balancing. I think uh, we have uh, uh, been talking about blended financing for, for, uh, for, for quite a while now, um, all morning, but we just forget that we don't just throw public and private money and call it blended, you know, or we uh, throw grant and investment and call it blended financing. We need to see the, 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 the risk balancing uh, and that's exactly the heart of, 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 of blended financing, is to allow for reallocation of, of risks, you know, to the point that, you know, some, uh, uh, you know, uh, there is a balance between the risk profile of the projects and the risk profile of the financiers. Um, you know, high, uh, high risk with very, very low, low return, you cannot go any, anywhere other than going to uh, uh, to grant sources, for example, but you know, low risk and high return, you can probably go to a bank. But in between grant and bank, there are so many other uh, other 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 sources of financing with their own uh, risk profiles, and we need to really make sure that those risk profiles fit with the risk profiles of the projects. So, you know, you go to equity, you go to venture, you go to whatever um, uh, you're going, you will see that, uh, that the uh, project will have to be matched with the risk profile of the, of the financiers. And then market integration. I think, uh, you know, GCF, of course, sits in an ecosystem of financing, in an ecosystem of, of, of project development. Uh, where you are and how you fit with the other ones, I think would be, would be interesting to see. Um, uh, two other points I'd like to, uh, uh, to, uh, to talk about would be, one is the standards. You know, I think the uh, you know, port, uh, uh, safeguards would be a very, very uh, uh, good way to do it. But uh, we need to make sure, again, that when we talk about conservation, we, we know that we talk about the same thing. Uh, when we talk about uh, um, you know, um, uh, reducing the underlying causes of deforestation, we know exactly that we are talking about the same thing. Um, red needs to be a developmental term, not only an environmental term, especially in developing countries. And for that, I think jurisdictional or landscape approach is where we need to uh, be going. And within that jurisdictional approach, uh, we need to, uh, 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 to know full well the role of the government the role of the local government and the role of the central government, and especially the role of the governments to, 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 uh, to enable and to uh, facilitate private sector investors uh, uh, to come in. Um, and for that, I think it would be really, really good to see some sort of a how-to document, you know, in each and every one of the countries, not only for Indonesia, but for any country, you know, if, like, like the, 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 the first question that I think uh, uh, one of my, uh, our colleagues uh, asked, you know, if I have a million dollars, what should I do if I go into Indonesia and want to invest? You know, the steps need to be uh, uh, well laid out so that, you know, no one will get lost in, in, in the country. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Now, uh, we are more than running out of time. Now, Marcel, can you make your presentation and we open the floor for, for questions? Could I have the machine for the, how do you call it, the thing to put the slides for? Is there one here? Where is it? Oh, you have it. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, thank you all for, uh, for being here. I'm just going to touch upon the, the uh, requirements to get actually projects uh, going. To, uh, we've seen a lot of theory, we've seen that there's a lot of legislation put in place, but actually uh, we don't, you see very little money hitting the ground. That's a huge problem. 
Uh, so uh, I'm uh, Marcel Sjoes, I'm uh, the country representative of uh, the Global Green Growth Institute. We're a fairly new organization. Uh, how does this work? Uh, yes. Uh, so we're a fairly new organization. We were established in 2012 with uh, 26 member countries and we're growing. Uh, and uh, Indonesia is one of the countries that uh, has supported the establishment of this organization. So it's an international treaty organization. We are uh, focusing on uh, uh, development and, and uh, the, the promotion of projects that uh, simultaneously achieve poverty reduction, inclusive growth, uh, environmental uh, sustainability, and economic growth. And we try to do that, for instance, in very complex uh, systems like peatlands. This here is a, uh, uh, just a, uh, you could see that as a peatland, that circle there. It's a deep peat in the middle, uh, more shallower, often very degraded peat in the, in the, on, the, on the, the edge, and then mineral soils around it. We see that as one landscape. You cannot address the restoration needs in these landscapes, which are huge, uh, just by dealing with part of it. You need to have a integrated, uh, comprehensive approach for it. Uh, it's like uh, if you're sitting in an uh, aeroplane and uh, the right side uh, is uh, allowed to smoke and the left side not, that doesn't work. The same is with peatlands. If you allow drainage in one half, uh, uh, it doesn't work because you can't uh, restore the other half. They're interconnected hydrologically. So all the stakeholders in that landscape need to collaborate. And that is a very difficult. It requires innovation in governance, but it also requires innovation in many other things. So let's say we have here a, uh, a, a peatland landscape. There's a lot of uh, business that can happen in this landscape. And uh, each of them, uh, or many of these, are very innovative. They're high-risk commodities because they're unproven or they're orphaned commodities. They need to be developed, they're running 100 years behind in terms of development compared to palm oil. But they have a lot of potential. Tenkawang is, for instance, a species that can produce oil-rich fruits and that could replace palm oil on peat without drainage. Uh, the carbon credit business is a high-risk business. We don't know in which direction the policies are going. Uh, the uh, galam wood is a species that grows up uh, uh, automatically after peatland degradation. In many places, uh, it flowers all year, so it can produce honey. It has leaves that can produce cashew uh, uh, uh oil. And uh, it can also produce poor wood. But the policy frameworks in Indonesia at the moment do not even recognize this as a crop. And uh, communities that would want to plant it in the area might not be able or not be, it might not be legal to harvest it under current policies. So there's a lot of things that need to be done there. Aquaculture in peatlands. Peatlands are very fish rich, but uh, there's hardly any experience in how to cultivate these in cage, floating cage cultures or in fish ponds. Uh, there is some traditional knowledge on this, but how to upscale that, how to improve it. Uh, then on the mineral source, there's a lot of proven business, and we can't see the mineral source apart from the peat, so we have to uh, also look at what the uh, economic development opportunities are there that may alleviate the pressure for development on the peatlands itself. So, um, so I mentioned unproven business creates a lot of risk. These are barriers for investors. Uh, there's a need for a lot of feasibility and cost-benefit analysis. There's an absence of relevant finance mechanisms behind this, uh, particularly if you talk about business, we should talk also about smallholders, about farmers, farmer cooperatives. People often think just about the larger companies, but these are the majority stakeholders in all these landscapes. And they also are the majority in terms of numbers of people that need to have green jobs and need to uh, feed uh, people. So there is at the moment hardly any finance mechanism in Indonesia to reach to these people. There's no microfinance institutions. Um, and then uh, there are no ways at the moment to de-risk their enterprises. We are asking these people to go into areas that can catch fire in every dry season, where they may lose their crops. 
that they plant there. Uh, we asked them to go for innovative uh, crops that are unproven. Who's taking the risk? Can we ask these poorest of the poor people to take those risks? Or can we get support from government as well as from other investors to de-risk these enterprises? So this is very important. Uh, it's a very challenging policy environment. Uh, there's a lack of a national and international carbon market. This is holding back carbon investors. And there's a lot of solutions to this that actually at the moment are not being discussed. So the question is why? Uh, there's a need for improved license processes. At the moment it's very difficult to switch, for instance, from a, uh, uh, a forest plantation concession to an ecosystem restoration concession. You have to hand back your license to the government and then you have to buy the new license again. Why not simplify it and allow a palm oil company on peat to turn it into an ecosystem restoration concession without cost? And preferably give them a subsidy to help them do it. Um, there's a lack of synchronized spatial and land use plans. There's no transparency of plans, so there's a lack of information exchange between government departments at all levels. And there's a lack of clarity on land tenure. So these are all risk that, risks that need to be addressed by government, but also by the, they're, they're being faced by the private sector. A lot of uh, operational challenges, there are no trade change for many of the products that we're looking at or they're underdeveloped, they need to be facilitated, there's no specialized equipment to deal with re-wetted peatlands, uh, there are no storage facilities for the products that come from these peatlands like the fish or the, the, the tankawang oil, um, and there's a lot of legal challenges that need to be addressed. So some of the solutions that we could look at and where we look at government particularly to take particular steps is uh, to help uh, development of new business models. So develop uh, public-private partnership programs uh, for such uh, new businesses to incentivize uh, investments in research and development and to streamline uh, corporate social responsibility initiatives such as uh, the SCCM is doing. Uh, create new financial mechanisms, so we can think about fiscal incentives for private investment. We can talk about uh, guaranteed minimum prices for innovative commodities, so at least uh, the farmers know there is a market, uh, at least a minimum offtake. Uh, we can talk about uh, mechanisms for increasing the credit worthiness of smallholders, so they can get access to microfinance. Uh, by, for instance, putting in place micro-insurance facilities and other risk-sharing facilities. We can look at uh, enabling policies, harmonizing policies in and between sectors. We often see that uh, policies are made just by, for instance, the Ministry of Forest, Environment and Forestry or just by the Ministry of Finance. These policies need to link up with each other to be workable. Uh, we can talk about the establishment of a national carbon market. At the moment, the Indonesian government is afraid, actually, of the international carbon trade because any carbon that is traded internationally cannot be counted towards the NDC. So that's a very valid, com uh, uh, val 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 valid uh, concern. So how do we address this through a nested approach? You can establish a capped international market. You can, for every uh, uh, carbon project, uh, provide the government with the first right to buy. There's a lot of money hanging out there. There's 800 million from Norway, a lot of finance from uh, uh, GCF, there's finance from the FCPF, uh, a lot of finance for performance-based uh, payments, but also a lot of potential for upfront financing. I think uh, once the Indonesian government defines what the rules are for carbon trading, then the, uh, it becomes a very attractive, it could become a very attractive market for investors to go into. Um, Okay, then there's a need for incentivizing community-led uh, peatland restoration and innovative developments, inclusive developments. At the moment, again, there are no policies actually that support that in a sufficient manner. Um, you can streamline operations through the, the harmonization, harmonization of uh, resource data and land use data. Uh, we can provide also investment in creation of facilities at the community level to create higher added value products. A example is for instance with Sangon, which can be planted in the mineral source around peatlands. 
if you uh, introduce uh, particular equipment, communities themselves can create the base product for plywood, which gives them a higher added value from that product. And then the last point, uh, there's a need for enhanced legal structures and go for the governance of the, the finance mechanisms. So quite a lot of uh, things, but I would like to emphasize particularly smallholders are private sector and they are the ones that can manage these landscapes if they're being incentivized and facilitated. At the moment, the mechanisms for that are lacking. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marcel. So we have like uh, minus three minutes, so we can take three questions if there's any burning question. No questions? Hungry? No hungry? Okay, well, thank you very much to the panelists. Uh, there's a question. Wait, wait, there's a question. That's, thank you. And sorry, everyone. <laughs> uh, I was just gonna, I was thinking about what you said that we need new mechanisms and and especially because you also focus a lot on small uh, companies or enterprises or initiatives. And I was wondering if uh, there's actually a very rich startup, technology-driven social entrepreneurship community in Indonesia. I'm fairly new to the country, but I've already seen that this exists. And some of them are actually really advanced in what they're doing. And I mean, I think there could be a good potential for synergies here and maybe having them bring what they already have implemented and their knowledge in making things work on the ground quickly and bringing them to the conversation. I think there could be a lot to learn that could be exchanged and used for such a, a larger impact topic. Is there any, someone working on that? <laughs> any ideas? Anybody want to take? Yeah, community-based community -based companies. Here you go. Uh, thank you. Very, very good question. Um, actually, uh, uh, you know, some of our uh, partners, partner investors, and us are actually working on smallholder uh, farmers, and you know how to basically. Uh, the idea was basically is that uh, that, that uh, uh, you know some of uh, some of these farming uh, uh, practices actually are quite detrimental to uh, or risky to uh, to conservation you know the uh, increasing a risk of uh, encroachment when they start uh, you know adding more um, uh, farmlands uh, the, so the idea is basically to provide financing to them to increase their productivity to the point that they will be able to uh, to not expand uh, when what they need is to uh, to increase production and by doing so we uh, uh, the government could um, could uh, uh, enforce uh, the, 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 you know, uh, 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 the regulation a little bit better. Um, there are two uh, things here in the smallholder uh, 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 financing work. One is what we call the last mile, you know. Uh, the delivery from, you know, the, so for example, IFC or GCFs, millions of dollars into millions of rupiah, you know, in, 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 in uh, certain uh, uh, villages in Indonesia, for example. It's not really easy if you don't want to get trapped into the micro-lending model, which is very, very expensive. Um, technology actually helps a lot. Technology helps a lot, it reduces the cost of uh, money quite considerably, and that is one thing that you need to uh, pay attention to. Uh, uh, second is, uh, is, is, is replicability or scalability. Um, you know, one, one scheme may work in one village, but may not necessarily work in all villages. And um, what you don't want to do is exactly to tailor every single financial scheme in every village, and, and that also is uh, very, very ex expensive. One way to do it is, is, is to put an intermediary, a financing intermediary in between large uh, financiers to, uh, to, to smallholders, and that may actually work. And that's exactly what we're doing, is basically to, to be the intermediary or to create intermediaries in all these um, areas. But I certainly agree with you. I think, um, um, I think uh, small 
stakeholders and small enterprises, community-based enterprises, enterprise uh, uh, um, uh, uh, financing and, and, and development is absolutely important. And um, like you, I wish um, uh, there were um, more in this room that worked on it. Thank you very much. I was anyway. One minute answer, Marcel, please. Yeah, your question was about startups as well, and uh, you, s you said uh, that, that these mechanisms are ready for supporting startups, they're working quite well. Um, there, of course, there are a lot of very good initiatives ongoing uh, from government, private sector, uh, but what we aren't seeing yet is how to deal with the whole landscape-wide approach that is required to deal with these complex and very high-risk uh, landscapes. So the governance structures for the to, to arrange the communities, uh, to enhance the capacity to collaborate at that scale, uh, that is lacking, and you, do, you can't deal with that, with that uh, through startup funding. But you need to have uh, a slightly different kind of finance mechanisms to bring that about. Thank, Thank you, you so much. There was one question, I guess we can take one. Sure. In Thank you. Thirty seconds. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I just I find a lot um, of times when we come to these regional meetings. Um, you know, there are some challenges and then there are solutions, but there are often a lot of steps in between the challenges, you know, to get us from the challenges to get to the point where those solutions could actually kind of be implemented. And they're often very specific different circumstances. And so when we're in these regional forums like this, I wonder on the topic of forest finance, what are the things that can be progressed at a regional level, given the kind of specificity that we're talking about of these different solutions and approaches? When we come to have this, to address this topic at a regional level, what are the things on which we can make progress at this, at this kind of regional level in these kinds of dialogues? I would just be interested to know the panel's comments on that. Or does this all come down to very, the very specific situations in individual countries and, and even you know, villages, as we just discussed now? Is that clear? <laughs> Let's ask them. <laughs> Do you have uh, an answer for that? Is that is, uh, uh, well, look, I think the thing is that, you know, something like finance, which is incredibly specific, is something y you do at the project investment level. The, the value of the regional dialogue is in sharing the experiences of what's working in the various different countries and then thinking about, well, would that work here? I mean, picking specifically up on sort of smallholder finance, we're do doing a project at the moment um, in the region, which is basically, you know, risk-based lending to smallholder farmers using mobile phones and, and, and basically using the data of their mobile phone usage. So, I mean, that comes out of the urban space, um, that technology, basically, that, that risk-adjust lending. And then all you do is, is you basically overlay the geospatial of where they are what their underlying commodity is they're growing, and then you can bring in the weather models and all the maps, and then you, you end up with incredibly precise risk-based lending using a mobile platform um, when, and you completely take away all of the costs that are so prohibitive to smallholder financing, which is having branches and, and doing the paperwork and having loan officers, and that, I mean, you just completely take that out and then you can actually take out that piece of risk that's in that underlying transaction, put it at a portfolio level, and put it to the markets. So, you know, those types of examples, these regional things about, oh, wow, I heard that, great, let's, can we do that in Indonesia? Um, but I, I, I don't see that there's a, a big polit re regional political thing that relates to uh, this financing space. Um, there is actually one mechanism that is dealing with kind of regional finance. I don't know at what level you see region, but for instance, provincial, yeah? Uh, no? Asia Pacific region. Ah, Asian, <laughs> oh, Asia Sorry. Pacific. Oh, Sorry. That's very large, yeah. No, then, uh, then I don't have an answer. Uh, but at a, at, a, at a provincial level, of course, there's the payment, uh, uh, the performance-based payment uh, mechanisms that uh, kind of incentivize uh, regional or, or local government to uh, to actually uh, plan for sustainable development for landscape-wide restoration. Uh, but with that, uh, the finances, Norway, uh, World Bank, have put actually the target very high. And what we're looking at is a need to actually set examples on the ground, project-based, pilot projects that are investable, that are bankable, 
it's very difficult to get uh, provincial-wide projects at a bankable stage. Um, so uh, I think that is one of the conundrums that we're looking at at the moment. Okay. Well, with that, uh, thank you very much, everyone, for your participation, and thank you for our panelists. So <laughs> now Martin is going to have the, the closing part of this session, and I guess you all have to stay here.